So it was one of those lazy Saturday afternoons that every once in a while will pop up in my schedule. I didn't have anything really pressing to do that day. So, so I was just kind of sitting on the couch surfing through TV stations. You guys ever do that? No plan to watch anything, just kind of looking to see what's there. That's what I was doing. I was kind of surfing around. And I don't even remember now what it was, but there was something that caught my attention. And so I paused for just a second to see what it was. I'm embarrassed to admit that it was the, the PBS station, okay? I don't ever watch that station. But whatever this thing was, it caught my attention. And so I paused on the public broadcasting station, and I watched for a couple of minutes. And then it was then that I realized that what this was was a documentary about a bridge that they were building across the Mississippi River in Missouri and Illinois. I guess we have to count both of those states. I know you're listening to that and you're thinking, that sounds exactly like the kind of thing that would induce a lengthy Saturday afternoon nap, right? And I would have thought that too, except as I, as I watched this thing, it really got interesting. It, it told the story of this, of this bridge they were building, the Clark Bridge, that would connect the towns of West Alton, Missouri, with the town of Alton, Illinois. And they told the story of this bridge all the way through, starting from the very beginning when they were identifying that the old bridge was going to need to be replaced, it couldn't be repaired anymore, to all of the engineering and design and the surveying work that had to be done to find just the right spot and how they were going to do all of it. And then all the way through the construction project from the, the setting of the piers, the foundation on which it would be built, to the construction of the structure all the way to the day the bridge had opened and they had some big celebration to, to market. And, and along the way, they talked about all the problems that they faced, figuring out just the right spot and dealing with the current of the river, which hampered the work, and, and dealing with the climate. I mean, it's, it's Illinois, right? It gets, it gets seriously cold there in the winter, like sometimes the temperature drops below freezing. That's shocking for all of us, but it does that there. And, and they had to deal with the 1993 flood. Mississippi flooded in 93, and that's when they're building their bridge, talking about making a mess of their project. That flood messed up the whole thing. You know, I started that program knowing nothing about bridge building, and I went away, honestly, having learned some things about that process that I didn't realize. Some things that I want to share with you as we think about a bridge that we need to build. Not a bridge like this, right? I don't think any of us are involved in that kind of a project, but, but I do think we have a bridge to build. I think we have a bridge to build to the laws. In Mark 16 and verse 15, Jesus commanded his followers to go preach the gospel to every creature. It's our marching orders as disciples. It is the work that we're supposed to do. And what I'd like to say to you this morning is if we're going to do this work and we're going to be effective at it, what we've got to learn how to do is to build a bridge to those are people who are out there who need the gospel. And so since I've watched a PBS uh, documentary about this, I'm an expert in bridge building. And I want to share with you some things I learned about bridges that will help us with this bridge we need to build. Let me begin with this. Number one, you'll be shocked at how deep my knowledge goes, okay? But it starts with this. Number one, bridges are needed. See, I told you I really know about this, all right? We don't think about that very much, how much bridges are needed, right? In fact, some of you, some of you used them this morning to get here. If you lived in Lumberton, you've got to drive over a bridge to get to this church building, right? Is it over... Is it over that creek right there south of Lumberton, Village Creek? Isn't that what passes under the interstate? Yeah. You had to get over that bridge to get here today. And if you live east of here, out toward Vider or Orange, that way, there's that big bridge right before Beaumont that, that, that crosses over the Natchez River, right? You had to pass over that bridge to get here. And you didn't even think about it, did you? You just buzzed right over that thing and happy there wasn't any traffic backed up on I-10 today. A rare occurrence, but you were happy about that, right? Now I want you to think about those bridges you crossed over today. 
And I, imag- I want you to imagine that they weren't there. What would you have had to do to get to worship today? If you came from Lumberton and the Bridge Over Village Creek wasn't there, how far would you have had to go out of your way to get to this building today? You may be thinking, boy, that bridge wasn't there. I might have to go to church somewhere else. That's a long way around to get all the way to Beaumont, right? Bridges are needed. This bridge they were building along the Mississippi River connected these two towns. It was an important connection. I'm thinking especially the people in Alton, Illinois, which is almost sort of a suburb of St. Louis right there on the northeast side of town. Even though they're actually in Illinois, they are just outside of St. Louis. But I will tell you, if they didn't have that bridge there going across, those folks would have to go way out of the way to get down into the city of St. Louis. They needed that bridge. And as I thought about that, it occurred to me that lost people need a bridge, right? I mean, we understand where they are because we have been in their shoes. Everyone of accountable age in this crowd knows what it is to be lost because we have been lost, right? separated from Jesus, cut off from the source of spiritual life. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1, Paul would say that we were dead in our sins and trespasses. In Isaiah 59 in verse 1, he talks to the people of that day. Isaiah does about how their sins had made a separation between them and their God so that he could not hear them. We are in sin, cut off from the source of spiritual life. We need to get to Jesus when we're lost, right? We need to get back to him so he can so he can give us life you with me sounds pretty simple doesn't it the only problem is just like that big river between west alton and alton there are things that get in the way make it hard for us to come back to jesus let me ask you what was your struggle when, when you were out there, do you remember being lost when you were away from Jesus? What was, it, what was it that you had to overcome to get back to him? For some people, it goes far back to their childhood. Maybe some people grew up in a very dysfunctional religious group and they just saw some bad things. They had a bad church experience and now as an adult they look at church buildings and they think I'm never going there you ever encountered someone like that I mean they say I know about churches I've been there I saw that in my youth I saw some awful things those were terrible people I'm not ever going back to that place and so they've got to get over that that's a problem Other people believe the cultural myths they hear about Christians. They watch guys like Bill Maher on HBO talk about how dumb Christians are and and untaught and backwards and hateful and, and bigoted. And they don't want anything to do with that crowd of people. They've just bought into the cultural lies that people tell about. Was that a struggle for you? For some people, it's getting past their religious heritage, all the denominational things that they learned growing up, and, 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 and then suddenly when they study the Bible, they realize that didn't get them back to Jesus. But they're going to have to give up their denominational past if they're going to be able to find their way back. Other people, I think, aren't even thinking about it. They're so caught up in this world and its stuff, they're just looking for the next party, not a bridge back to Jesus. And then I think there are people out there who are looking who want to find him. They're in the pit where sin ultimately takes you, and they're miserable, and they're unhappy, and they want to come back. They don't want to get there. And that's where we enter the picture. What they need is a bridge to help them find their way to the source of spiritual life. And listen, that's what Jesus calls us to be. You got your Bible? I'm headed over to Matthew chapter 5. Will you go there in your Bible? Look at Matthew chapter 5. Beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, right? He introduces it with the Beatitudes, describing the character of people like me and you who are kingdom dwellers. But then in verse 13, he's going to tell us how that character impacts the world. So, picking up in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We'll come back to the second part of that verse in a minute. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Now listen to 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now let that passage linger. Let's grab one more. I'm heading over to Philippians now. Philippians chapter 2. Look at down at verse 14. Philippians 2 verse 14. Paul writes, Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Here it is, listen to this. Among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. You see that? Paul says it. Jesus says it. Disciples are to be lights to the world. In this dark work of, our, world of ours, we shine as lights so searching people know where to turn for help. We shine the light so they can find their way back to Jesus. People ought to look at us and see that our lives betray every cultural myth about Christianity. You realize that? They ought to see that we're nothing like our critics say that we are as they see our love and compassion and care for other people. In fact, the joy and the peace that you and I have in Jesus, those things ought to cause the lost around us to want what we have. Think back to Matthew 5 and verse 16 when he said, let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And when they come to this place and worship here, the kindness that they are extended, the passion that they see around them about worship, the focus on God as the object of worship ought to say to them, not every church is the same. There are places that are different from where I grew up. We shine as lights. So people who are lost in darkness can find their way back to Jesus. Do you see that? That's what we're called to do. Brothers and sisters, it's a bridge to get over all that junk people have, separating them from Jesus. Helps them find their way back home. We don't save anybody. We just shine the light so people can find their way to the one who can save them. When I was watching that documentary, one of the things they talked about was the importance of this bridge being constructed of, of good materials. In fact, I, meant, I remember a lot of attention being given to the suspension cables that would hold the bridge and, and how they had to be coated in a certain way and protected from the elements because it had to hold that bridge up. Listen, whenever I pass over a bridge, I want it to be solid, okay? I don't want that baby going down. When I drive over that big bridge over the Houston Ship Channel, I think about that, man. I hope they put good stuff in this bridge. Because I want it staying up until I'm all the way over to the cross, right? It has to be constructed out of good, reliable material. They talked a lot about it. And I got to think of Matthew 5, 13. You still looking at that? About the salt that has been corrupted. You know, the salt, when it gets other junk in it, it can't do what it was designed to do. What Jesus says, it's worthless. It just needs to be thrown out. Have you ever thought about what that's saying? Because he's not talking about salt there, folks. He said, we are the salt of the earth. And the horrible possibility is that I will let myself be so corrupted by the world in which I'm living that I can no longer be the kind of material he needs to build this bridge. Have you thought about that? The hard truth is that when we are corrupted by the world around us, we are worthless to the bridge build. And so, what's the lesson? I need to look at my light. I need to consider whether or not I'm shining. Do people see in me that Jesus has something better to offer? My light needs to be that bright, shining light that helps them find their way back because bridges are needed that's one of the things I learned 
watching this documentary. There's something else I learned that's really critical. When I say this, you'll be impressed at my deep knowledge of bridge building. Here's something else I learned. If a bridge is going to work, it's got to touch down on both sides. Now, I told you you'd be impressed when I shared that with you, that I picked up on this insight. In fact, maybe that is the most basic element of bridge construction. If the Clark Bridge was going to serve the community of Alton, Illinois, and West Alton, Missouri, that bridge had to touch down on the Illinois side, and it had to touch down on the Missouri side. And you're thinking, yeah, I probably didn't need you to share that with me. We could have skipped those two minutes and it put us ahead of everybody else getting to a restaurant for lunch, right? I think we understand that about bridges. I'm not sure we understand that about lost people. That if we're going to build this bridge to them, we need to be sure that it's getting all the way to the other side. And I'm saying that, brothers and sisters, because I am convinced that we don't always realize our bridge isn't getting to the other side. We're reaching out to be sure. We're making efforts to reach lost people. The question is, are we reaching them? Are we connecting with them in a way that they can understand? In fact, I think the problem runs deeper than that. It's not just that we're not connecting. We don't really know where the other side is. We don't understand where lost people are. See, when you're as old as me and Max are, it's pretty easy to think that the world we're living in today is pretty much like the world we've always lived in, right? And even if you're younger than me and Max, we still have the problem that for many of us, our world revolves around disciple. We live in the disciple bubble. The people we interact with every day, our closest friend, are the people who make up the spiritual family here. And so as a result of that, we get so tied and connected with each other, which is a good thing. We just talked about that in Bible class. We get so closely tied and connected with each other that we wind up kind of being unplugged from the rest of the world. And the consequence of that is we don't ever always really know where people are. In fact, if I could just be plain about what I'm trying to say, I think people are further away than we imagine. I think that other side, it's, it's further on than we, than we think it is. I think people know a whole lot less than we imagine they do. Can I give you an illustration of that? So around the last week in August, I want you to start looking at our bulletin board. Because we're going to begin to get advertisement from churches all over the area. Some of them outside the area. I think some of the meeting ads we get are probably optimistic. I'm not driving to San Antonio, okay? That's just how that is. I want you to watch when the meeting announcement starts popping up on the bulletin board. It'll happen in the, the, the spring and the fall because those are the only two times a year you're allowed to have a meeting, right? And as they begin popping up on the board, these special events that churches are hosting, often designed to reach out into the community and to try to get people to come and study the Bible, right? That's often what, what, what these efforts are about. I want you to look at what's titled across the top, okay? Big, bold, two-word advertisement. What's it going to say? Gospel meeting. You already do, right? I want you to watch how many of them will have that title. Big, bold letters. Gospel meeting across the top. And underneath it will be a date and a preacher's name and maybe kind of a goofy-looking picture of him. Especially guys who've gotten older and they're like, you know, using pictures when they were 27 to advertise the meeting, right? Gospel meeting. I heard a really funny story about that. Guy was out trying to encourage people to come to the gospel meeting. He's handing out this flyer, and he handed it to a friend, and he looked at it, and he said, gospel meeting, gospel meeting. Is that the kind of thing other folks can come to? You ever thought what those two words mean to someone who's never darkened the door of a church building before? If they're having a meeting at your job, do you get, do other people get to go to that? Can I show up at your company, attend your meeting? You ever thought about that? You see, we live inside the bubble, right? We understand that language that we use. But folks, if the meeting is about reaching the community, don't we need to plug that in a way that will make some sense to the community? 
We're extending a bridge. But it's not getting to the other side. Do you see that? That's just a simple illustration of the problem we're running into. It just seems to me that if we're going to be busy building bridges, if we're going to go to all that trouble, we need to make sure they're getting all the way out there to the people who need to hear the gospel. And so I think Paul's a great example of someone who did that. You got your Bible still open? Head over to Acts 17. Acts 17, look down at verse verse 16. When Paul was in Athens, before he ever preached to anybody, he made sure he understood where his audience was. In verse 16, it says, Now Paul, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So I kind of get this image in my mind of Paul walking around Athens, just sort of evaluating this city, this culture, these people that he's trying to read, right? And so later, when he has an opportunity to preach to the people of Athens, the Greek people that were there, in verse 23, what does he do? He talks about one of their altars. I saw this altar in your city to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you about that God. In verse 27, he cites one of their poets to connect with that crowd. I'm impressed that when Paul comes to Athens, he first understands his audience. Do you see that? So that he knows how to reach out to them and talk to them. I think we need to do the same thing. For the next three months, we are focused on building bridges to lost people. That's our new quarterly theme. And as a piece of that, folks, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the people we're trying to reach and where they are and what it's going to take to get to them. For those of you who were in Ben's class, you remember Ben taught that class using the book Tactics? That is a great book that we all need to read because that was a class about where people are and what we're going to have to do to reach people where they are. So I hope you'll plug into that for the next three months because if we're going to build bridges, it just seems to make sense to me that we make sure they're getting to the other side. Last thing I want you to think about is this. When we build bridges, we need to be sure they're constructed on solid foundation, right? We don't usually think a lot about the foundation of bridges. When we look at bridges, we spend a lot more time looking at that nice, pretty finished picture up at the top, right? That's almost kind of a a pretty picture to see, isn't it? A nice, big, finished bridge. We don't think much about that picture of the bottom where they're where they're laying the foundation for the bridge. A documentary talked about it. how those engineers had to dig down below that river and find something solid to build that bridge on. They had to drill down underneath the water to find it. And then once they did, they, they put enclosures around and pushed back the water so they could get down to that solid stuff and start pouring concrete for those piers. They wanted to be sure that this bridge was on solid stuff. It needed to be. It's going to be taking a lot of beating current of that river constantly pressing on it all those big trucks going back and forth listen this was going to work it had to be on solid foundations everything else the piers that hold this thing up the cables the road deck all of that depended on this bridge resting on a solid foundation and so I thought about that when I thought about this bridge that you and I need to build, how it needs to be resting on solid foundations. Let me tell you what that means to me. Some religious groups, in an effort to extend that bridge and reach out to lost people, some religious groups have resorted to what I would call religious gimmicks to draw people in. And so on their website, they will put a a video of their contemporary styled worship service with a great band and professional singers and they'll try to draw the crowd with that contemporary service and on their website they'll emphasize the weight loss classes and the new gym they've just added to the building where members get to work out for free 
And they'll talk about every kind of counseling class they supply from weight loss classes to money management classes to marriage counseling advice. All the different things they could do are to lure folks in the door. In fact, in fact, a couple of years back there was a church right here in Texas down in the southwest part along the coast. There was a church right here that on Easter Sunday promised to give away 12 luxury cars to 12 lucky guests that Sunday. I thought about taking a vacation day and visiting. (laughs) Can we talk about what's wrong with that? I guess you would have to admit that that bridge is getting to the other side. It is connecting people, but not on a spiritual level. It's connecting with people on a carnal level. And not getting people to where they need to be. Folks, we're not like a local furniture store trying to convince people, hey, we have the best price on your couch. You need to come here. We are a rescue mission trying to convince people that they are lost and they need a Savior. It's not about drawing a crowd. It's about drawing lost people to Jesus because they need salvation. That is our purpose. It's the purpose of God's people. We see that from the very beginning. Go back to Acts 2, our Bible reading for last week. We saw this in Acts chapter 2. And so Peter, Peter is preaching to the crowd on Pentecost. And what does he say? Listen, you don't want to be a Jew anymore. You want to be a Christian because we don't have to offer those gross sacrifices, man. No more killing your sheep. Come here. That is not what Peter says. Look at verse 22. This is Acts 2 verse 22. To the crowd, he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested by you, uh, to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. What does Peter do when he preaches the gospel on Pentecost? He confronts this crowd with their sin. In fact, in fact, down in verse 36, he continues, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucify. Do you hear it? One of the things about gospel preaching, ladies and gentlemen, is that it lovingly confronts people with their terrible predicament. We're not trying to lure crowds to this church. We're trying to tell a lost world that they are lost. That they are sinners. And that it is the greatest crisis that they're facing. Why do we do that? Why do we tell people something so terrible? So that they'll be ready for what comes next. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? How did Peter get them to that place where where they're longing for a solution to the problem? He told them what the problem was. You got to tell people that they're sinners so that they'll be ready to ask, what do I do about that? And we can give them the good news. There is no good news to be preached until someone knows they're a sinner, folks. And so Peter says in verse 38, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who for, are for all. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept absorb, uh, exhorting them saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those, those who had received his word were baptized and there were added that day about three thousand souls when i say that the gospel or rather that our bridge needs to rest on solid foundations i'm talking about the gospel brothers and sisters we go out and we build a bridge for people by preaching to them the gospel of jesus christ we can't build the bridge any other way you don't build it on gimmicks not trying to lure a big crowd trying to bring lost people to the same 
And so for the next three months, we'll be focused on this vital work. You saw the signs in the back, I hope, when you came in. If you don't, watch when you go out. We're trying to build bridges to lost people. And so, if you will pay attention, <clears throat> we will work that theme into our lessons on Sunday morning and Sunday night at regular intervals for the next three months. We have determined that our fall focus will, will be on this theme, preaching the gospel in the 21st century. How do we reach people today? We've got a couple of guest speakers coming to be with us. Bill Sanchez from Atlanta will be speaking on September 2nd. Trey Haskett from, Tennessee, from Mississippi rather, will be here on September 23rd. They will be delivering lessons, talking to us about how we preach the gospel in these times. Dustin will start a special class in August that will focus on a dimension of this work. It's entitled On Guard. And every day, every day our Bible reading from the book of Acts will take us back to the first century and the early disciples as they executed their marching orders to go preach the gospel to every creature. Let me be clear about something, brothers and sisters. All of our talk for the next three months about building bridges, all of our talk for the next three months about building bridges, all of that talk will not save any. One of the biggest problems among God's people today is that we gather in places like this and we talk about how terrible it is that people are lost and how much we need to be going out and rescuing them and that's all we do is we talk. Souls will not be saved until someone gets out and builds a bridge. So will you do that? Think about those four simple things we talk about all the time that we can do to reach lost people. I can go out and shine. That's what Jesus told me to do. To, do, to exemplify the godly life, the better way he offers before the world. I can go out and I can speak. I can let Christ and his word and what a blessing that's all been to me, what it means to be saved. I can let that find its way into my conversation, even with people who are lost. And while all that's going on, I can extend, I can extend a simple invitation. Why don't you come and see? Why don't you come visit? Why don't you investigate this for yourself? I hope that, that July August and September, we'll see a marked visitor flow at Dallin Road because we're, we're starting that bridge. We're inviting people to come. And when we have guests in this crowd, we need to embrace them and receive them. Let them know that they're loved. Let them know that we care about them. Find out why they've come. I hope with all these guests that come over the next several weeks that we're going to set up some Bible studies and use them to build a bridge, to shine a light, to help someone find their way to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, there isn't anything more important in this life, nothing more important than being right with Jesus. It's why we sing an invitation song at the end of every service. Because there may be someone in this crowd that needs to make things right with Jesus. If that's you, whatever your need, I hope this song will move you, that it will prick your heart, that it will make you desire to take the step you know you need to take to bring peace in your relationship with him. If we can help you do that, you make your way to the front right now. While we stand, while we sing.